management, specialization in water services management. Okay. Draw the microphone close to yourself so you don't uh, pull it closer. Pull the hole in the stand. Yes, everything. Yeah. Good. And then we have uh, also in the studio today Maria Luisa uh, Salinge. I hope I pronounced it correctly. No. Okay. okay. All right. Um, she is also a, a master's student in water quality management from the University UNESCO IAG. IAG means what? Institute of Higher Education. Okay. In the, she's graduating this April? Yeah, April, 24th April. Okay. Thursday. And uh, she is the chair lady of the UNESCO IAG Student Association Board 2013. Are you still, or you, that was last year? Yeah, that was last year. Last year. Okay. So welcome to our program this morning. Yeah, thank you and good morning. Wonderful. And then we have a third panelist called Tom Ogo. Yes. Okay. Uh, introduce yourself to us and tell us what you're doing at school. I'd like to provide listeners. My name is Tom Ogo. I'm from Kenya. And uh, I undertake a master's in uh, hydrology and water resources engineering. Mm. I'm glad to be here and be part of this discussion. Awesome. I'm excited to have uh, these young people around me. Well, if you are listening to this program and you care and believe in the young people of today, we want you to participate by giving us a call on 020-737-1619. Now you are home, you're relaxing, you have no excuse, you have to participate and share your thoughts and opinions on, on what we are going to discuss today. How to empower migrant youth. You know, youth are traveling all over the world uh, for a better life or to improve themselves so they can serve their generation better. Now, what are the primary drivers or motivations for migration of our youth overseas? What, what, is, the, what is the primary motivation and the driver for people like you migrating overseas? Who's going to uh, break the ice? Said. Okay, um, thank you, um, our host. I would like to say that um, when it comes to drivers, actually it talks about um, uh, things that actually, the factors that actually could make you leave your old shore of your country to another country. I think uh, you would, uh, to me, I would say you want to get a um, better understanding of things. Because if I say better knowledge, you have knowledge in your country. But understanding actually cuts across um, technical efficiency that is actually inbuilt in other country, which you think that you can actually borrow and empower yourself with and uh, um, domesticate it in your country. So I think we want to get more understanding, we want to get more education, mm -hmm. we want to get uh, more technological empowered and uh, want to really become a better person mm -hmm. so that by the time we get to our own country we can domesticate new skills, new knowledge and improve our society. Wonderful. Marilo, you want to add to what he just said? What was the motivation for you uh, coming overseas to do what you're doing? Yeah, I just like saying it for me, I, I came to Netherlands for greener pasture, like uh, improve myself, enhance myself professionally. Wonderful. Yeah, in terms of academic, I want to have the international or European standard. Yeah. Uh, of course, we have the knowledge, but we want to have the international connection, and uh, it yeah. helps a lot. Wow, I think you've been very, very forthright with that, I like that. And uh, Mr. Ogo, 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 I'm not sure how to pronounce correctly. Oh, good. Oh, good is good. You're getting it right. <laughs> Thank you. What was the motivation for coming overseas? Particularly the kind of training that I'm getting here is uh, specific. It caters for the needs from the region where I come from. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, we see the various challenges that are affecting people, but especially in Africa, regarding water. Water is a key essential commodity in our lives. And uh, we have to do what it takes to be equipped with the knowledge, skills, and uh, to be able to manage and be able to sustain this uh, precious commodity. Uh -huh. So, uh, Netherlands is one of the best training uh, countries in town when it comes to issues related to water. Yes. And that's one of the things that motivated me mm. to take up this opportunity. So, now you've been here for, uh, I see about two years or so. I don't know how many years the program has been. Yeah, um, a year or more? 18 months. 18 months. Yeah. yeah, so what have you, I mean, how do you feel? Do, do you think you have the, what it takes to go make some huge impact? And what do you foresee as uh, the, let's say, the challenges or the barriers which might be overcome for you to be able to transfer the knowledge and experience and the skills you have acquired back, you know, to wherever you're going, you'll be going back to? Yeah. Yeah. 
Can I answer the yes, question? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Uh, for me, I think uh, the knowledge that I gain here is so much. Like, uh, in terms of, because we're doing water management yeah. and water education, the knowledge that I had at home is different from the knowledge that I got here. And then uh, the knowledge that was in part to us is not only based on the water situation in Europe, but we were also exposed with other countries. And we have international professors who, are ex who expose us to different water situations. So I really, really gain a lot. So tell, give a specific example of uh, what you have there and what you can do better, you know, with the knowledge that you have acquired. I want to understand what you yeah. Actually, I came from the Philippines, yes. so my water situation is different because yes. uh, Philippines have 7,100 islands, so literally 7,100 7, islands. So we, we are literally so much of water. Mm -hmm. So uh, way back home, with too much water, we consider it a problem. Mm -hmm. But when you when you see the situation of other country, mm -hmm. water is scarce, so it's a problem. So. In here, uh, I'm not only exposed in the Netherlands water situation. Uh, we went to Spain, which is a semi-arid of Europe. Yeah. I also went to Portugal, and my thesis was also in Vietnam. So quite different. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see, uh, what you see in the books is, you see that you understand it. No, it's different when you experience it. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I gain a lot by experience. Okay, my question is still not answered. What specifically? Mention one thing that you think you are going to do or change based on the knowledge you've acquired. Something specifically. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. Because I am a chemist by profession, so I, in terms of water quality, mm -hmm. so I learn a lot in terms of water quality. So if you're talking about water quality, I can help. I, I gain a lot. And then I, I because in, I'm in, in water management, this time I'm not more on technical things. Mm -hmm. I can now... With my knowledge in UNESCO IDG, I can now mix the water management, the social perception aspect, and the technical skill, like interdisciplinary discipline. Mm. Okay. <laughs> we'll um, Sahid, what about you? What do you think, what do you think can make an immediate impact? If you, if you are landed in uh, Nigeria. Nigeria today, mm -hmm. yeah. where do you think you can really hit the nail on the head? Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, I would like to say that um, to me, it's in the nail on the head. It will be in terms of uh, building the capacity of um, general managers of water utility. Uh, to my country, um, like my contemporary I said, it's different for every country the water situation. Uh, for my country, we are suffering from economic efficiency. Economic efficiency in the sense that we have water resources at hand, but how to manage it is the exact problem. So, what do you do in that kind of a situation? You draft an action plan. And how do we do that? You mobilize people, you mobilize community, you mobilize the government. And you to, and you the microphone is not, it's not strong enough. So okay. right. You mobilize the government, you mobilize the community, you mobilize local people in order to actually empower them in terms of skills. And what do you do first? For me, I would like to say empowerment of the general managers of water utility because they own the control. Being the manager, you control the personnel, the financial department, the technical department. By the time you mobilize them, you change the orientation then you gain more commitment towards proper management of water. And along the line, you can actually domesticate these challenges towards um, um, the lower staff, and we can actually have more water across several areas in Nigeria. Now, you come from Nigeria. I mean, I, I mean I'm just wondering, with all the bureaucracy that we face mm -hmm. back home, yes. how realistically you know, can you make an impact? Because you know uh, the idea, the ideas you're talking about, they're good, they're brilliant, you know. Yeah. But what are you going to do if you meet up with obstacles and opposition? You know, which you never expected. Yeah, one thing about it is that every time you meet up opposition, yeah. but I think opposition you can only succumb to opposition if you are doing it solitarily. If you're taking up <laughs> solitarily, you face opposition a lot, and you can succumb to them. But when you realize that things in life is all about collective responsibility. When I was in Nigeria, I worked with CSO, civil society organization. If we could mobilize civil society organization towards this kind of a mandate, you will see it is going to be realistic. Because they are part of a, um, a group of people that are very close to the local people. They also have their own form of connections that they can actually support you with. So if we can move CSO along the line, 
and you can actually be able to pay Kotze Advocacy Visit to the relevant agency, get them enlightened about what you exactly want to work on, then they could be addressed with information of what you want to do, and through that you can actually succumb them and you can actually domesticate the kind of skills and knowledge you want to actually do. Is that for one particular state or, yeah. or I mean, is that just for one particular state? Or do you think uh, it's, for the, it's for the entire nation? Is that oh. for what the plan is? It, um, yeah, the plan actually, one thing I feel like... One state or for the nation or something? Like yeah, you could broaden it, but you start from small. Somewhere, okay. Fine. Thank you very much. Um, now, let, we're talking about empowering migrant youth. So you guys are migrant youth now. Now, what, uh, what are the perceptions and the experience, uh, what were your perceptions and experience on arrival in the... In, uh, in, in your destination country, which is here, you know, what before you came, what ideas did you have, and now you are here, what have you, have you been confronted with, you know, how do you balance the two? I have, did you experience a culture shock? Did you experience uh, something that, I mean, was your world turned upside down, you know, and did you feel yourself uh, disempowered in a way? I mean, what, what, what have you experienced, and what have you taken from all of this? As youth, and, and what you see as a challenge, and how can you be, you know, help, you know, or support it so that the best of you can come up. Have you understood my question? <laughs> it's very broad, but you know, at least it's, it's talking about the same thing. Yeah, actually, uh, if I could uh, say something, I don't know my friend. Uh, you... Yeah, go ahead. Right? Okay, Tom, and then Tom. Tom, Tom. Yeah. Uh, I can respond to that. Um, generally, the perceptions, in my opinion, uh, what I what I've seen before and what I experience now is quite different. Well, back at home, the perception is built mainly because of what you see, maybe through the media, maybe through other forms of uh, information, uh, especially the TV. So what I knew is that this place is very developed and uh, ev uh, everything is uh, quite advanced and the yield expect also in terms of the character of the people and uh, so on. But on uh, coming here, uh, we see that it, there's not much difference uh, in terms of uh, uh, being human. Uh, the abilities that we have uh, are the same abilities that the people here have. It's, it's not that uh, there's something superior. Okay. So the only thing that is different from where I come from and here is a matter of time and a matter of organization. Uh, the perception was also that uh, uh, if we come here, maybe uh, we will not be able to find people or uh, places like home where you could be able to socially integrate. Uh, but good thing, uh, the Delft community is much more cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. We have people from similar backgrounds, similar countries who can be able to uh, provide us uh, that particular uh, environment that cushions this the effect of, let's say, culture shock mm. or environment uh, shocks uh, in that way. So you're saying you have really found that you didn't miss out too much? Yes, because of the kind of setup we have. Uh, but I, 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 this situation is not uh, for everybody. Not everyone experiences this when they come from their home countries. Some people have told us of much more uh, difficult situations they have gone through. Mm -hmm especially after arrival. It all starts even from the airport after touching down. It becomes very strange um, because one, you meet the different language, so there's a language barrier in there. Two, uh, people are more of individualistic and uh, uh, you have to really come out as really somebody who is confident and knows what they do uh, unless you raise suspicion. So there's certainly also perception within the host community about the people who are also coming here. So there are quite a number of challenges that with time either you learn a way of how to survive mm -hmm. uh, or if uh, you're lucky you can find people who can shield you and uh, help you to go through the transition smoothly. Very, very good. I like the way you have spoken. I think you touched on some of the issues that with migrant youth uh, do encounter when they move into a new environment, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad you touched on that. Uh, Marily, you feel like it's like you want to add something to what he said? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, I agree with Tom. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, yeah, the first thing that I encounter when I arrive in Netherlands is time management. You have to be 
pang tall and everything. And then of course, uh, I I was I was adjusting with weather. So we only have dry and wet season, and here uh, it's very cold. But I agree with Tom. When when I arrived with Net in the Netherlands, we belong to the same community. So it's like when you are in Netherlands, you have to search for which community you will be with. Yeah. So we are at home with our community. They like, uh, we call it home away from home. And then talking about our family bit way back home. So technology help. We have the Skype and the Facebook. So it's more or less like we're still in touch. Yeah. Yeah. So with Tom, we always uh, we we make a point that we will be meeting each other and communicating every week, yeah. every Sunday. So it's like yeah, we're still together. So when we're living down, we will meet each we will really miss each other so much. Really? Yeah, because we tried our best to be, because uh, we are here alone in different countries. We try our best to be with each other, to help each other, yeah, to be with each other. Then you go to Africa. Awesome. That's yeah. good. That's good. And I plus for that. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I think it, it's great when you are students and you, know, you come from different, different parts of the world and you yeah. connect, you get together on campus, you're still doing the same study. Yeah. At, at, at the point, you become like a family, you become friends yeah. sometimes for life. It, it's great. So you guys enjoy the experience. Okay. So um, how close to or distant from your goals are you at this point? In your migration experience, how yeah. close to yeah. or distant from are you as far as your goals are, your migration goals are concerned? Yeah, you talking about empowering yourself, you have something in mind, uh, a goal to achieve. How close are you or how far away from you uh, at this point in your migration experience? Yeah, can I answer the yes. question? Yeah, uh, the, my, my main purpose of coming here is professional growth, yes. mainly academic, because uh, way back home I'm teaching in university. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I getting another degree in MS, but I already also have an MS way back home. But, uh, of course, when you have an MS in European standard, it's different. The years of education. So, as at the moment, maybe I'm almost 45% almost there because I haven't attained my PhD degree yet. So I'm aiming for that. I think all of us, maybe most of us here present, are aiming for that. So with a European degree, I will have bigger chances for bigger universities for water education. So you yeah. probably want to be a lecturer? I'm already a lecturer. Life. I mean, for life, so to speak. Yeah, for life, because uh, I, yeah, it might be, uh, I don't know, it's very idealistic, I don't know, whatever. Uh -huh. I, I, uh, because I'm a chemist by profession, I should be in an industry, yeah. but I think my calling is in teaching. Okay. Because for me, teaching is that you can touch a lot of people, mm. and uh, for me, knowledge, sharing knowledge is more important to me. And it's, uh, if my students are successful, for me, I feel personally Satisfied. rewarding. Fulfilled. Yeah, mm -hmm. fulfilled. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Said, uh, what's your take on that question? Yeah, um, How close or far away are you from your, your goals uh, you know, in your migration experience? Well, I, I would like to say I'm not even started. <laughs> I think that's where I would to come from because um, I've just spent um, six months and my colleague is... Oh, so you've got just six months? Yes, yes. just okay. six months old in Netherlands. Oh, so I've not started at all. Oh, Gotten more of the you skills. You act like you'll be here for years. <laughs> you're yeah. very active, very dynamic. So yeah, one thing you about kind of, you know, carry, uh, portray something totally different. Yeah, yeah. One thing about it is that um, sometimes you try to look ahead, yeah. you try to get empowered even right before you empower. Yes. And I think that's exactly one thing students need, or everybody needs to learn. You keep yourself abreast of information every time, and you try to work um, as aggressive as you could mm -hmm. because that will actually help you a lot. So uh, I actually envy my colleague here because I never had any master before now, <laughs> and I'm just a BSU and I just just graduated anyway. But I hope to get my professoria soon. <laughs> and like my professor would say, he said you need to work very hard. You need to work very hard. So I really give regards to that, and um, I would like to say the sky is still the stepping stone because six months is just a small day. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, 
Now, and, and what, what do you think could have been done? We're still talking about empowering young people, youth as migrants. Uh, what do you think could have been done better in terms of your preparations to migrate? Uh, because all of this we're talking about, I look at it this way. <coughs> uh, you have an expectation before you left the camp and you're here to do something. Uh, at the same time, you want to be relevant, you want to be fulfilling, you want to do something with whatever you are getting or you've gotten. Uh, you find yourself in a certain context, a social context, a political context, an economic context. You want to really find your place at your spot so you can make an impact. You see? So I want you to evaluate all of this in the context of where you are today and, 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 and where, you are, where you are going. So, so the question is, um, what could have been done better in terms of your preparation to migrate? I mean, is there anything, now you are here, you think there's something you could have done better to improve your, to enhance your migration experience or to, to empower you to be better and to be, to be more fulfilled in whatever you are pursuing? Yeah, yeah, if I, I would like to come from that aspect and I would like to say some brief thing of uh, what has really happened to me and uh, what has actually made my stay a little bit um, lenient and comfortable. Um, one of the scholars sponsored by Rotary International, yeah. in affiliation with um, UNESCO IHE. So UNESCO is actually paying part of my um, uh, bill for studies and accommodation while Rotary is also paying part of the bill. And um, I really learned a lot from um, from Rotary International before I actually came here because you are both screened in terms of morals, in terms of academics, and before actually before them agreeing to pen um, paper, to pen on paper and actually support you for your studies. Yeah. And I know my colleagues might come through different programs. So we were meant to see ourselves as an ambassador and we're given quite a brave um, information on what is expected of us mm -hmm. and that we mustn't um, denounce our, our, our country and Rotary in general because they've actually stood by us and screening us, uh, making us look very fit because at one point we were psychologically motivated. You are going there to create landmark. You're going there to break record. You're not going there to do any other thing than that. Mm -hmm. So you mustn't, you mustn't rubbish the name that actually drag you into your present situation. So I think that um, some community actually doing so much to actually support people. And they are supported in terms of um, resources, in terms of what you need to know. Even getting them to Netherlands, I am affiliated to a Rotary Club where I'm also been um, motivated. Mm -hmm. I was, I've had speech with them and um, some of the top guns have actually motivated you. Oh, you are here for your studies, you are here for this, you are here for that. I think um, that kind of community is very rare. Wonderful. It's actually very rare because community that tends to follow you right from your own country down to your country of destination, I think um, it's really, really a rare discussion. So we need to actually have that kind of community for our young people as well because if that kind of community is not there, I wouldn't have been here okay. in the first instance and I wouldn't have been so much um, aware of the society. And I will share one experience again. I have a nurse counselor called Martin Cole. He taught me how to ride a bike. I never knew how to ride a bike. You mean, you mean here? Over here? Yeah, okay. yeah, in Holland. He taught me how to ride a bike. And that is to tell you that it's part of empowerment because it gave me new skills. Yeah, exactly. Now I can ride a bike to any place I want. So I think um, things like that are actually very rare. So we could learn from this experience that to empower people, you empower them in terms of knowledge, giving them resources. You also empower them in terms of skill, telling them, making them know how to ride a bike. It's part of it. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's part of skills because bike in Netherlands is an asset. Yeah, that's so true. I could, I could want our you to learn from this. And also the larger society because the larger society owns the responsibility of making the youth know what they need to know at the right time so that it can be beneficial and contribute to the sustainable development of the environment and the society. Thank you. I probably you have a very solid uh, social uh, network. network or background, uh, which is fantastic. Um, um, Tom, you want to add something quickly to that? And then I will... Uh, just if you have. Yeah, just a general comment. Okay. Um, specifically for me, uh, and maybe I will even advise people who uh, have the thoughts of maybe migrating to seek for opportunities. Um, first of all, you have to do a proper research of where you're heading to. Yeah. And uh, look at it also as a means. It's not. It's not an end to where you're heading to. It's as a means to uh, improve your life. It's a means uh, to take you to the next level. What you're looking at. Yeah. And with, with that, uh, do a proper research. Uh, get to know the basics about where you're heading to, 
and also if if you are in a position establish the necessary contacts mm -hmm. in a destination so that on your arrival uh, they can cushion you on some of the uh, the things that might, you might find there as shocks. Mm -hmm. So did you do all that? I did part of that. <laughs> I luckily uh, I managed to do a proper search. At least with the internet age, you can be able to access information, uh -huh. so you can have basic information. Uh, and also there were contacts, uh, students who were senior students from my country who I managed to contact, mm -hmm. and they were able to advise on a few things, which came in handy. Yeah. Wow, awesome. Okay, so um, are there any specific problems or challenges you have encountered so far? in your migration experience and uh, uh, yeah if you have uh, share them with us uh, personally uh, this for all of you of course yeah go ahead you have to, um, the main thing my first thing which was the language how do we go about some of this did you study in English or Dutch in English yes okay so the Dutch is a new language especially when I arrived here the first time uh, and in relation to the language, actually speaking the language or communicating isn't a big problem, but getting uh, to use the language to make your stay here uh, meaningful is what is the issue. A good example is when you are looking, let's say, to buy items, basic essentials. Yeah. Uh, let's say you are going to the event supermarket and you cannot tell which item is this yeah. and what are the ingredients in the item. So you find you might end up getting something that uh, is not what you thought it is. Yes. And you end up even spending and uh, finding that, that you throw away what you thought you had bought. <laughs> uh, you end up throwing it away because uh, you did not get the proper uh, mm. understanding of either what the ingredient is or what it is about. So what's your recommendation for, for either the, the Dutch society or for those who are, you know, so the people who are migrating into this part of the world? <laughs> Ah. Based on your experience? Based on my experience, uh, I think the world is going global and we are expecting to adopt a universal language. Uh -huh. We, as an individual, and I think also my colleagues, we do appreciate the host country and their culture. Uh, but also, it can also go a long way as some countries are trying to adopt mm -hmm. to create at least uh, an alternative in terms of communication for people who are visiting or are coming to stay who are not natives in the country mm -hmm. so that they can be able to uh, to relate to something similar or to be able to find it easy to learn and know the basic things around mm -hmm. the environment uh, or uh, what they take, uh, what they go through in their daily lives. Okay, thank you. Well, if you're listening to this program, we're talking about how we can empower uh, our migrants youth uh, if you maybe you have you came here as a young person yourself or you have relatives who are young people who have migrated uh, for study for work or for a better life or, or because of a marriage and there are all kinds of issues which come up and which they you know they, they have to deal with uh, it's important that there is a, a, a social network or, or uh, let's say a net a safety net uh, where they can fall back on where we can support and sustain them so they can they, they, they don't go through what we went through so they can you know be up and running as fast as possible and so if you are listening to this program and you have a question or a comment about this topic and you want to speak to our young people please give us a call on 020-737-1619 we have students from the international um, institute for water, institute education. water education a, a, IH is what international what Higher Education, no, no. UNESCO, uh, IHE, yeah. uh, they are here all the way from Delft to, to, to share the experience with us as, as migrant youth. Okay, uh, Mary Lou, you wanted to take a break, take a break. react on the topic, the question I asked you earlier? Yeah, take a break. Uh, you want to do that quickly and then we'll, we'll take a short break after that. On specific challenges, he spoke about the language thing which he experienced and uh, uh, encountered as a challenge. Uh, what, what was yours? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, my, the, the major problem that I encountered in my breaking here in the Netherlands is that my university that I am in is hesitant to send me here. So because, Why? Uh, they don't want to lose you. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so he, I, I, let me compliment you. I think you are a powerful organizer. You are so full of energy and uh, wow, the guy is amazing. Okay, so the next question is um, how much better would you like to be empowered to become more relevant and an asset to the Morgan uh, diaspora? your home country. Why? Because uh, now you join the manga diaspora and it's like you've been cast into a sea of maybe, you know, a, a, a strange sea, so to speak. I mean, you don't, you don't know everybody. You said that you have to form new links, new connections and, you know, get adjusted. Uh, but then, how do you feel that the net supportive network that is already existing of other migrants in the diaspora, how can they help? So you can be empowered to become more relevant and an asset to them and possibly to your whole country. So, um, if I may say something, yeah. I, I would like to say um, if we were to be more of an asset, it would be on um, how to how do you or think you can actually um, use the knowledge and skill you've acquired? Because that is what will be the contest, the best contest for you to actually uh, try as much as possible to become more relevant. Because if you have to become more relevant, are you ready to share the knowledge? Are you ready to share the skills? And the second question will be, are the networks or the enabling environments there for you to actually do that? Mm -hmm. And I would like to commend more recent development that is ongoing in the Nigerian community. There happens to be Nigerian, um, Nigerian students in Netherlands. And um, they are trying so much under the ABLE um, convener, uh, who happens to be Rockbo. And um, we guys are also part of it all. And we're trying to see a very good avenue to actually connect or to bring together all knowledge that and experiences that individuals have actually acquired and how do we use that to actually help others so that they become more of an asset as we are because we have individual different experience then we can actually gather all these experience share the experience that makes ourselves and become much more experienced and of course we have our own kind of a position or sphere where we can influence others because um, our influence actually cuts across different status. So by the time we'll be able to bring about all these individual sphere of influence together, we become more of an asset. So that becomes more of a huge venture here in the diaspora. And how do we do that back home? Is to actually link to the network back home. And uh, at this point, I would like to say that it's very much good if there could be a collaborative effort from the three starters in my country, from the federal level, the state level, and the local level. At some point, if they could give recognitions to those in diaspora, what they've done, what they've actually um, tried to achieve, and try as much as possible to host youth organizations from each and every community yes. where they can actually have access to share information, share knowledge, because it is only through this they can also see that, oh, people up there are actually assets to them. Because if you don't share the knowledge, share the experience, you're never an asset. That's true. So I think that we can actually become assets in the diaspora where we're more organized where we're able to domesticate new skills, where we're able to like get together, share experience, and when we get back home, we become more of an asset when we're able to share these new skills to people and they to they feel, oh yes, this is it. This is how we can do it. And not through the back doors and just become very strict. And I think that's the asset as well. Okay, let's hear Tom. I would like to echo what Sayyid has said and uh, uh, borrowing from that, uh, I think it's even in the good book which says uh, Iron Sharpens Iron. And also, they say that uh, a candle does not lose its light when it lights another candle. Sharing information is very key, especially where information and knowledge is needed. Uh, but uh, in developed can developing countries, rather, mm -hmm. as, uh, for example, of, let's say Africa, is in dire need of people who are ready to share knowledge and skills mm -hmm. in a simplified manner, because uh, the level of how literacy uh, matters a lot here. Mm -hmm. The people who have reached certain standards of education and they can be able to process uh, uh, information at certain levels. So we need to cater for such groups and be able to simplify information. Uh, uh, we are in a water institution. 
water is life uh, and literally and uh, a lot of processes a lot of uh, activities economic activities is related to water mm -hmm. and uh, our communities need this kind of knowledge and skills we need to simplify it and basically uh, like he said uh, we need to have wherever we come from uh, uh, policies uh, which cater for uh, absorption of, of uh, let's say people who have acquired skills from where they're coming from and being able to transmit it down to the ground uh, where it's needed. So those policies must be in place. Who must uh, formulate or put in place those policies? You mean the, the government? Actually, uh, as you speak, a lot of governments, especially in Africa, in Asia, where uh, development is really required, mm -hmm. have already existing policies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that it's a matter of uh, as young people yes. to be more proactive in influencing uh, the current leaderships yeah. in one way or another, whichever the opportunity. And uh, I think even with the help of, let's say, media like you uh, here, uh, as we encounter, interact with even personalities who are influence uh, in leadership, yeah. we can be able to uh, link especially with youths so that they can create that avenues and support that is needed. Mm -hmm. Because we have the energy, yeah, but if the systems are, are not support this energy, yeah, it, it, it goes to waste. Goes to waste. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why I like the, uh, the, the Nigerian, what do you call it? You call it Nigerian Nigerians in yeah, Niger yeah, Nigerians in that diaspora organization, Nido. I like it very much. I like that platform and what it's trying to do. Internet, I mean, in, uh, in network with the government, you know, connect with the government, and, and there's an exchange of ideas, the transfer of technology and, and for knowledge and all that. It's a very, very powerful platform. And I wish all other African uh, countries can adopt that uh, sort of uh, system. Uh, so that those in diaspora can, you know, have the liberty and the opportunity to transfer, you know, whatever they've learned over the years and overseas. Okay, uh, Marilu, you have your last word. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, for the last question, uh, I agree with Sahid and Tom. Yeah. Uh, we, after eighteen months, I think we have the appropriate knowledge to be to share to people in mm -hmm. our country. But I think uh, with the knowledge, we have to have the proper proper venue. Yes and appropriate authority, Yes. but we can only do that with the support of national, regional, and international okay. institution, okay. so that we will have greater influence and we will have a bigger voice. Yeah. So, so how, what do you recommend to be done, let's say, in the Philippines, for whatever you have to say to be passed down to those who must hear it and make use of it? Yeah, uh, actually, wh while I'm here, uh, for my remaining months, I will uh, be looking for uh, international organization, institution, yeah. that I will introduce Philippines uh, for possible project to help problem, to augment uh, our problem in water system, water sanitation in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So I will uh, try my best to have international connections so that I will have more projects. It could not be directly benefit me, mm -hmm. but I will uh, channel them to my friends in the Philippines. Okay. Know? Well, I see that there isn't a direct uh, channel to, to really take up what you have to offer. I can see that. And uh, which is a, a big, big disservice to the effort and the time you put into this study. If, as, if there was a link with, let's say, your embassy or your country, uh, and they know what you're doing and they want to already find a way to filter it back into the system, would that be fantastic? The same goes for all of you as well. Those lines, those channels should be there so that whatever you are doing can directly go to service whatever is happening down there. Yeah. On this note, I would like to thank you so very much for traveling all the way from Delft. I'm sure you lost some sleep just to be here. <laughs> God bless you richly, and I want to wish you all the best with your study, and uh, I hope we'll stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for inviting us. All right. God bless. Thank you.